And in the future, um, we're going to see a lot more drought. We need to do things like desalination. Where's the energy is going to come from? So you can think about intermittent, but we really need energy 24-7. And we also don't have a lot of land. I find fusion to be the most compact clean energy available 24-7 based on. So I think that's something worth investing. And I think that's something worth fighting for, for, you know, not just our generation, but the future generation as well. Welcome to Tough Tech Today with Mayan and Miller. This is the premier show featuring trailblazers who are building technologies today to solve tomorrow's toughest challenges. Welcome to Tough Tech Today. We have the honor of being joined by Tina Tosukowong, Investment Director at TDK Ventures. At TDK Ventures, Tina is focused on uh, topics uh, associated with climate technologies, deep carbonization, recycling, and fusion. Uh, she and her team have led an investment in Type 1 Energy Group. And so, Tina, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit more, uh, double click into these investment areas of interest to you? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. Um, as you mentioned, um, I lead the climate tech investment uh, at TDK Ventures, and we have a very broad uh, thesis on climate tech investment. And this is because um, in my mind, uh, climate tech is such a huge problem, perhaps the biggest problem for our generation. And when you want to really decarbonize uh, the industries, um, you have to look broad. Um, we, when we look today, um, 40 gigaton of CO2 emission annually. I think three fourths of that is from the energy usages of fossil fuels uh, that we use in household, we use in the industry and so on. So one of the most important thing is to find technologies to really um, get away from fossil fuels. So that includes uh, transitioning to electrification, that includes uh, new energy generation, such as from fusion, and uh, it also uh, includes uh, several things that would uh, allow for electrification, like um, critical metal explorations, uh, as well as recycling the end of life batteries and critical metals so that we can have uh, renewable, sustainable uh, raw materials to support the electrification in the future. And um, we also look at all industry that are big energy users and try to find the technologies to overcome those. So those are some of the example of things that we've been busy with. I just had a quick quick follow up on you know TDK Ventures as a whole. So, and before we dive deeper into uh, this week's theme or this quarter's theme of fusion, uh, so for TDK Ventures with your theme of kind of green technology, uh, climate tech, how do you measure success of your fund? Yeah, um, we measure the success of the fund uh, just like other uh, financial VC. Um, we wanted to see the company really move the needles, uh, make sustainable contribution to the world. And the good measure of that is the financial return. So we just like other funds that we want to see the company generate outsized returns. And if they get to that, it means they must have grown their revenue. They must have really scaled their technology. They must have really implemented technology and really sucked a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere or avoided the CO2 generation. So um, that's our mission. We tend to invest uh, in the early stage as well when the technologies uh, have a room to grow, when the technology is still had a low valuation, and then we work alongside the entrepreneur, the syndicate to help build the company, take it uh, out to the market, and really uh, hope to see it be implemented. So one time the uh, CEO also asked me, like, how do you define success? Um, and I really tell the CEO, I think success is when your company really put the technology in the market and you generate real revenue and becoming a sustainable revenue 
generating company. I think that's when I think we, we are successful as the investor and the entrepreneur is the, uh, is also successful as the uh, technologies to take it to the market. Hmm. My my understanding is is uh, TDK Ventures is is managing. I mean, I, I think maybe a little northward of about three hundred fifty million dollars. So that so that assets under management. Uh, how how walk us through some of the the, the investor mindset in terms of um, investing in uh, I can say the, the climate technologies that are not generally. 100% software based. So there's a hardware component, which, uh, as sometimes I say, hardware is hard and it takes it, the, the timelines can take longer than what uh, some other venture investments in other fields and domains may be accustomed to. How, how do you think through the, the, the kind of sort of economics and, and hopefully sort of back end impact of some of these, these deeper, more capital intensive projects? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, we are 350 million AUM fund total. Uh, that's divided into three funds. Uh, fund one, 50 million is already fully allocated. We have fund two, uh, 150 that's doing both digital and energy transition investment. And then the newest fund, the S1 fund, uh, solely focused on energy transition. And the core focus is um, deep tech, early stage company. And these sometimes uh, take a much longer horizon, uh, for sure, because you are talking about having to develop some hardware and having to really put some things together to make a component, a solution to sell to the customer. The customer have to test that hardware, adopt it in their process, and they have to integrate that and sell their product. So uh, most of the company we have is a uh, B2B company. Um, but, you know, doing something hard doesn't mean that it's not a good thing to do because think about it, a uh, company that uh, do hard tech like these, oftentimes um, they have a very good uh, protection. They have, they generate the IP that is defensible. And uh, once you get to the point where you have an IP that defensible and you have successfully launched a product to market, then um, you have a pretty good chance of uh, taking a pretty good portion of the market share compared to investing in fintech, investing in marketplace. I think it's very different dynamics. Maybe you can get to the market early, but you could see hundreds of companies doing the same thing because um, it's very hard to become defensible. Customer might be able to switch over the product uh, in a very short time frame. So for d tape hard tape it's a uh, higher risk, higher capital, but higher reward as well in our opinion. Yeah, so those, those barriers really help the companies, you know, build the moats as they grow. Um, one question I have for you is when you're looking at like time horizon in deep tech, sometimes you seem to have a larger time horizon. That's a concern that some people have, but it's kind of balanced with, like you said, the larger moat and kind of building of intellectual property. Um, for some technologies like Fusion, that horizon is definitely far off. Do you see um, uh, potential returns um, on an immediate um, timeline, like between, bef between now and when we get to kind of that breakthrough of net positive Fusion? Or is your approach to kind of be a more evergreen investment approach and uh, give most of the returns, you know, down the line. Yeah, I think we are still uh, like other financial VC firm where we want to see the exit uh, outcome within sort of like 10 year horizon. And the way we approach Fusion is that uh, we've seen sort of like the first wave of Fusion startup that uh, unfortunately uh, has been around for a long time and haven't exited yet. So when I first uh, looking into Fusion investment thesis, uh, I was very hesitant as well, trying to make heads and tail uh, for this space. But in the end, uh, we think that the inflection point is now because you start to see the breakthrough in material science, the high temperature superconductor, and you and we have done uh, quite a lot of landscape analysis. And we wanted to invest in technologies 
that has been the risk in terms of the physics risk in the national labs around the world, and then pick the technology that is closest to uh, be connected to the grid and closest to become uh, to generate a net gain, and then make a bet on that. So, and I think the type one checks all the boxes in terms of having the physics risk then mostly the risk by the national labs. Um, the most uh, famous one is the um, national labs uh, in Germany, the W7X uh, accelerator. Uh, that's a $1.4 billion project uh, uh, in Germany to de-risk the technology. So we think that they are pretty close to be connected to the grid. Um, so I think for Fusion, we don't recommend folks to invest in technology that is still super risky that you have to uh, de-risk the science risk. We rather de-risk the engineering risk and then go with that investment. So you, you mentioned uh, W7X um, at, at Max Planck, and I, and I understand that that's the world's largest uh, sort of presently fusion Stellarator uh, machine. Um, and it's not like there's, there's been a tremendous amount of learnings coming coming out of the the construction of that and and the and then the the, the the science physics that emerged from that. Can you walk us through the the broadly the the kind of like fusion landscape in in the in maybe in the U.S. and in the in the world? I mean, this W seven X is a, a German installation. Um, some of the world's best physicists there. There's also um, Princeton has a, a plasma physics lab that's um, that I think recently a couple of years ago spun out Princeton Stellarators, uh, Type One Energy associated to uh, University of Wisconsin and in, in, in Madison, and it's spinning out of there in 2019. Can you walk us through how? Yeah, as you were sort of coming into the opportunity space of like, wow, fission could be a thing and it, and it, it may be investable now and not later and not too early, you know, uh, how you thought about that? Yeah, I mean, um, as I mentioned, right, when we look at the overall climatic investment thesis, we have a lot of CO2 to decarbonize and we have wind and solar that um, doing pretty well in the past decade, the cost of solar has dropped 90%. But uh, we still uh, have to figure out, you know, the land you need to put it on, the fact that it's intermittent. So there needs to be something else that would provide the base load so that you can finally shut down a coal-fired power plant. And um, there's not a lot of things out there. Um, you can look at um, hydro, geothermal, but those are geographically limited. Fissions is uh, producing a lot of radioactive waste. So we were like, okay, we need to look at fusion, but we weren't sure if this would be close to uh, getting to the grid or not. So we did the landscape scan of the fusion. And I would say that the uh, approach wise, you have three main uh, different categories. One is the uh, magnetic confinement fusion which is mimicking the sun. You try to bring the hydrogen uh, closer together uh, via the gravity force for the sun. And then once it gets close enough, then it feels, uh, and then you release a lot of energy. And then another approach uh, is the laser fusion, where you have the fuel pellet. And then you try to compress the atom together by you use the laser to heat up uh, the shell of the pellet and then uh, it generates implosion and then it just fuels the atom together in a short burst of energy pulse. And then the third category is something in between. It's called uh, magneto inertial fusion. Uh, the company, uh, some company try to do the so-called the Z pinch approach, which mimic uh, how uh, you got the lightning uh, through the rod. And once you have the current flowing through, it generates the um, magnetic field that's compressed and can generate, um, can compress the atom together and generate fusion energy. We looked at all of these and we found that there are perhaps four reactor configuration that is very close to the energy break even, which is the energy out compared to the energy in. 
so far to fuse the atom to get it generate energy it costs a lot of penalty on the energy energy that you have to force the fuel together and the four um technology that is close to the break even is the tokamak the stellarator the laser and then um, the mac lift which is a uh, one of the variation of the Z push approach. Um, and there are several labs uh, that has been looking at these uh, in the US. Uh, if you are looking at the um, Tokamak, uh, MIT has a center. The UK has the JET, uh, the Joint European Taurus. They've been doing amazing work in terms of the uh, generating the energy. And um, there's a uh, international uh, consortium that is put together uh, the biggest uh, token map called the ITER project in France that is 20 billion project that has been under construction for two decades and still not done and unfortunately it was built upon the old technology low temperature superconductor so um, and then you start seeing a private company um, Commonwealth Fusion System that is going to build a spark project here in Massachusetts uh, with the high temperature superconductor and prove that you can take the magnetic confinement fusion in the tokamak configuration to net gain. So it's exciting that we'll see uh, something like this in the US. And for the Stellarator, we we'll talk about the world's largest um, project. Uh, in Germany, W7X, that's a very exciting project. And they are going to be able to show that um, you are going to be able to uh, really hold the uh, fusion condition for 30 minutes. So when you talk about token math, when you talk about laser, those are a pulse process. Once you show that it's getting to the net, yet you have to figure out how to become a continuous uh, power generation plan. But I think the W7X will show that you can have a new uh, reactor configuration that can actually generate uh, and hold steady state for a period of time. And then uh, for the laser, uh, the NIF, the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence uh, Rivermore National Labs, uh, they have uh, very famous uh, record uh, scientific energy gain uh, experiment uh, around Christmas last year. So that's the place where uh, you can find a novel and breakthrough uh, laser approach. And then the, um, the Z-Page approach uh, that you have uh, several uh, uh, facility, uh, there's a uh, Sandia National Labs uh, that are doing the experiment on the MacLift and there are a number of private fusion company that's looking at the technology uh, in this area as well. So it's very vibrant communities. Uh, you find a lot of private fusion startup. I think there are more than 40 private fusion startup companies right now. So, oh. Wow. So in, in March, you invested in type one energy group. Was, was it March? Awesome. Yeah, and we closed so uh, the March. Amazing. And so when, when you were looking at this, it's such a, you know, diverse, uh, field of approaches with lots of different companies. Um, can you dive in a little deeper about, you know, type one energy group, what really excited you about them and what made you confident that their approach was, um, you know, the right one at this time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, our investment thesis in fusion is that we want to get to the point where uh, one day you can shut down a coal-fired power plant and then you can generate energy 24-7 without radioactive waste uh, that have to be treated. So uh, when we look at fusion and we look at the top four uh, concepts that are close to break even, the stellarators stood out for us because it's the only concept that um, can generate fusion power continuously. Um, the difficult things about stellarator is that it's hard to build. 
because the magnetic field, uh, the magnets around it, around the reactor, is not in an easy shape uh, to build. It's a three-dimensional, uh, non-planar magnet. But those are very powerful magnets. If you can build it, then you have a wonderful uh, fusion power plant that can run continuously. And another anecdote about me is that I used to be an intern uh, in a power plant. So I feel like uh, with that engineering background, I, I get a lot of appreciation that uh, for the industry, uh, for the power plant that can run so long, 30 years, 40 years, it needs to be, uh, you know, a full proof. The operation needs to be simple. You turn it on, you walk away, it runs continuously. So we strongly uh, believe that um, that's the most fundamental things that uh, would eventually replace the coal fire plant. Um, so that's how we look at the sterilator. And we've done, we've looked at a bunch of uh, startup companies and we found the scientific team, scientific founders, um, they have built three or four accelerator in the past. So um, the team came together from the University of Wisconsin. They have the HSX accelerator. Professor Anderson uh, built those, um, operate those, and has developed a lot of theory that optimize the modern accelerator today. Um, Professor Peterson, uh, who is uh, currently the CTO, was uh, director uh, at W7X. He worked on the diverter physics, uh, which is a key component that uh, you need to exhaust uh, some of inert particles. And it's always uh, something that uh, not very obvious, but if you don't have that working correctly, uh, then you're not going to have a, a very robust power plant. So, and then now we have two other uh, scientific uh, founders uh, from Oak Ridge National Labs who have been doing the optimization for a decade. So I think this is the strongest technical team in the accelerator physics. And the management team, uh, Christopher Maury joined the company uh, at the end of uh, last year. He came from G Hydro, so he spent years in uh, utility, and he also spent time in uh, SMR nuclear fission as a CEO, and also previously the former CEO of General Fusion, and he's also the chairman of the Fusion Industry Association. So I think it's a combination of strong team, strong technology that would be able to pull off uh, such a hard technology like this is probably the hardest uh, technology we've invested in so far. So without a strong team, uh, I don't think this would be an easy challenge. Yeah, that's that's a rock star team that they pull together there. So that's definitely key to success. And and, and uh, world class investment, you know, requires uh, I think world class due diligence. Um, and so it sounds like it was. Uh, it, would you classify it, Tina, as as kind of a like sort of systematic, almost brute force uh, in terms of being able to to go through? Um, you, you mentioned like the, the 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 four sort of most best pathways from a physics perspective to get uh to like sort of net positive energy but within that it's it's like a hydra it seems like and now there's like there's 40 different uh organizations or companies that are working to to make any one of those four pathways is potentially um, uh, a commercial success if not at least a physics success right because those are two different aspects is showing that the physics permits this to happen the math and stuff looks like it suggests it could be possible, but then there's from an investor lens, that commercial aspect. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a little foggy in terms of how do we think about, um, when we should like, yes, the department of energy should be putting money into fusion. That makes sense. But then as private capital, professional capital that has an obligation to its limited partners and other interests to, to put, you know, every dollar in, try to get. 10 or a hundred dollars out that, that a calculation with fusion seems a little bit more like, well, you know, can you help, help 
help me get yeah. a little more sort of comfortable with that. Yeah, that, that yeah. Sense. I think this is why um, I think there are many fusion companies, right? And there are the two spectrum, the spectrum that takes the technologies that are very well proven among the top four up there in terms of the um, getting to the energy kit. And then there are another category that try to make a cheap devices and not a lot of proof. And I think um, the one that's tried to focus on building cheap devices without a lot of physics proof, I think that may not get to the exit. And yeah, for us, and we are of course biased, right? We think that investors should invest in the technologies that has already been de-risked and only takes the engineering risk. Otherwise, you may never get to the exit because you're just going to keep putting capital building a new machine, do experiment. Oh, we just learned a new physics and then do this. And it could become never ending because if you look at the total comeback, it takes 70 years to get to this point. Stellarator is the same. And if you're coming out with a new idea that hasn't been peer reviewed, it could take another 70 years to get somewhere to get the physics that makes sense. So, I think for us, when we underwrite um, type one energy investment, we are looking at a very outsized returns to compensate for the amount of uh, time that it would take. Uh, this is not going to be a three years exit, uh, probably become like seven to 10 years and things like that. So it's on that, you know, long end of the spectrum for the fund lifetime, but the uh, for sure, we are confident that if it works, it will be an outsized return because if you are talking about energy generation to replace coal fire power plant, it's not a billion dollar market, it's a trillion dollar market. So whoever gets there first uh, will get a good financial returns. And there are already examples of uh, fusion companies that have billions of dollar valuations. Uh, CFS, TAE are a good example for that. So we think that uh, the company uh, that can uh, get to uh, the energy game for sure will have billions of dollars of value. So you're kind of painting the division of what the returns you know, could be like. Can you um, just describe what a world would look like with successful fusion? Like how would that change our relationship to the climate, but also how we use energy as well? Yeah. I think uh, if the world is successful with fusion, uh, what we are seeing is that uh, you can really drop in a fusion reactor in the existing coal fire power plant, and then you can generate heat and electricity uh, to turn the turbine, uh, just like the way uh, you really use the um, uh, coal uh, boiler. Um, but things are going to be very uh, compact that it's going to be clean energy. And um, when we get there, there's going to be, you know, new job, new capabilities uh, that will be needed because there are certain things like uh, the material science has to be developed uh, to uh, really sustain that industry. So I think if we can get there, then I would be, uh, I think I will probably, you know, die peacefully, if you will, because uh, knowing that there is a way to actually limit the temperature rise within 1.5 degrees so my kids don't have to suffer. Right now, uh, it's hard to figure out what we're going to do because, I mean, when I first graduated, uh, first got my job in the industry, I know that the carbon capture technology exists. Uh, and I've even done the simulation techno-economics for that. But I keep seeing that it never happened because to do something drastic like that, you need a lot of energy. And in the future, um, we're going to see a lot more drought. We need to do things like desalination. Where's the energy is going to come from? So you can think about intermittence, but we really need energy 24-7. And we also don't have a lot of land. I find fusion to be the most compact clean energy available 24-7 based load. 
So I think that's something worth investing. And I think that's something worth fighting for, for, you know, not just our generation, but the future generation as well. I, I think that the, the public has um, a general understanding, maybe a little misinformation on or incomplete information on like say fission, uh, sort of our, our histor histor historical um, you know, familiarity with, with nuclear energy. Uh, could, could you help us draw a distinction of grid scale fission to grid scale fusion and, and what the difference is to the public there may be, if, if any? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I think we are very familiar with uh, fission and the catastrophe, right? Because fission, you start with heavy atoms like uranium and um, you generate energy by uh, you bombard the uranium uh, with the neutron and then it breaks apart and then it spit out more neutron and those more neutron, it hit the heavy atom and then it just caused the chain reaction and then you generate energy uh, a lot and it can become uncontrollable. So you need to have the cooling water to extract that energy out so then you can control the, the temperature because if the temperature go higher, then it's just going to create even more chain reaction and cause catastrophic meltdown. And what's worse is that um, if it's not controlled, it's not safe. And then the waste at the end of life, uh, those are still a lot of heavy atom, thorium and whatnot. And those uh, can last hundreds of thousands of years. So there are startup companies that try to reclaim some of the waste and reduce the ra radioactive half, half life up to like um, hundreds of years, but that's still quite a bit of work uh, to be done in terms of making it safe and then uh, remediate the waste. Fission is the opposite. Fission, you start with uh, isotope hydrogen, and then you try to fuse them together. It's very hard because at the nucleus of every atom, you have proton. And when they get close, they tend to repel each other and, you know, stay away from each other. So for fusion to happen, you really need a massive force to overcome the electrostatic repulsion. And once you lose that uh, temperature or the force, it just stops. So it's inherently safe and it's hard to make it happen. And the radioactive waste, um, Typically, you get tritium, uh, but tritium's uh, half life is like twelve years or so. So, and it and it doesn't create like a very severe uh, like skin uh, symptom and things like that. So, the level of um, the persistence in the environment is a lot shorter, and it's uh, fail safe, I would say. So, I think uh, it's. I think if we are looking for something that would be base low, it's a much safer profile. I got a vote for fusion, <laughs> hands down. Yeah. I had a question just out of curiosity on your, your personal background. So you earned a PhD from Georgia to technology and chemical engineering in 2006. How did you, what did your path look like going from, you know, PhD in chemistry to um, a venture capitalist. That's a that's a very unique path. So, could you let us help help the audience understand how you got there? Yeah, happy to share. Um, I was just talking to my classmate from Georgia Tech yesterday, and yeah, you know, I think when I graduated, I just uh, did the same thing as my classmate, which is uh, going into a petrochemical company or oil and gas. Right, those were like secure job back then. Um, but I think after a couple of years, uh, I realized that um, at the time, I just started to appreciate and learn about uh, climate change for the first time. I learned about the movie, The So-Called Inconvenient Truth. I think when I went to undergrad, I thought I love chemistry, I love math, I love physics. Chemical engineering sounds like the place to go. 
but I didn't recognize that um, using fossil fuel actually caused climate change. Once I started working, I become uh, understanding of that, uh, and um, that was the beginning of the Clean Tech 1.0 as well. And what I did was I jumped into startup to commercialize the technology to uh, convert uh, CO2 and sugar to chemical, renewable chemical building block through fermentation. I stayed there for eight years, um, scaling technology. Uh, once the plan, uh, commercial plan was up and running, moved into business development. So I've done uh, several jobs uh, in the startups and once it got acquired, uh, I thought I would go to another startup, but the opportunity present itself uh, to become investor and support other entrepreneurs. And so I decided to uh, switch uh, the seat, so become the investor. And it's very rewarding because um, I feel like I understood how hard it is to be an entrepreneur, to raise funds, to really uh, try to accelerate your technology, to see it uh, go into the market. And I really uh, also enjoy uh, getting to know all sorts of new technologies, uh, learning from other people who are smarter than me, uh, and really also appreciate the passion uh, that I've seen from talking to entrepreneurs. It's a it's a really it's a really cool journey, and I think it's something that maybe Tina, you maybe maybe you'll you'll echo this in terms of that there are. Uh, so many different ways to, and, and different kind of backgrounds that get, can work well within, say, venture capital uh, in, environments, um, and particularly within, so like the the, t the tough tech realm, where um, there is an enhanced uh, value on uh, on a very technical background, but not. It's not necessarily required. I think you may also agree, maybe agree with that. It's not that there are places for non-technical folks too. Um, but in, in your situation, where where you have uh, you know you 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 know how to research in, in, and very deeply on on technical topics to get to to add a lot more uh, say wood behind the arrow, so to say, on the hypothesis that we need clean energy. Fusion's a way to do it. Fusion may be ready for investability, and here's why, and then X, Y, Z. Yeah, I think um, for a company or for a venture to be successful, we need people from really diverse background. And uh, I think uh, when we put together a, a syndicate uh, for the ventures, we like uh, all, all sorts of uh, investors from various backgrounds, some may not be very technical, but they may have a lot of uh, financial background. So I think uh, diversity really complement each other. And of course I can contribute on the technical side. Uh, and similarly, we like to see the same thing uh, for startup companies. Having good technical team, uh, you always have to have a very good commercial team to balance out. That's how you come up the all-star team and all-star investor syndicate as well. Yeah, building on that, um, what kind of advice you know do you have for for entrepreneurs kind of getting their start and trying to let's say they've formed an initial team, um, they've got an idea, but they really haven't solidified the path that they're going to take um, as they kind of look forward to how they built their company. Um, what what advice would you have? Yeah, I think um, entrepreneurs really need to, um, you have to find your good lifelong partner because uh, building a deep tech company is a long journey. So you want to find someone to compliment you. If you just uh, graduate from uh, your uh, PhD program or without industrial experience, you need to bring in somebody uh, with commercial background uh, so that uh, you don't drink your own Kool-Aid and just develop technology that doesn't have the market. You want to understand customer pain point. That's the most important thing uh, to have a successful company. Understand customer pain point and try to find the product market fit as quickly as possible because deep tech is very capital intensive 
And the more you get lost in product market fit, the more you burn through your cash. Um, that would lead to a very bad outcome. You want to talk to the customer and you want to figure out which sector has a real need, a real urgency that uh, you can really bring the product and then they're going to want to try the product, do the pilot with you and things like that. So I think um, the technical team, sometimes we have a filter, try to perfect the technology, but you really want uh, the rest of the team to balance you out and bring in the full team with both technical and commercial expertise to be successful. Awesome. So kind of like on a venture capital firm, you want that kind of diversity of experience and very good points on, you know, getting to your product market fit as soon as possible. You want to be burning your capital, getting you closer to the finish line, not figuring out where to start. Yeah, Tina, if, if you could be uh, like Lord of the land for a day, uh, you know, what, what, would you like to see change from a policy, like from policy or other aspects like in the government um, to help us as the, 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 the humans on this planet, you know, to, so, cause we don't have, you know, a backup planet. So how do we, how do we motivate the, the changes that are needed for decarbonization, fusion systems that may come online maybe as early as 2030, but that doesn't solve all the problems. There's no, from what I see, no one shot Hail Mary kind of thing. What, yeah, what I, would you like to see difference, uh, different? Um, you know, in yeah, case the right I ears hear it. <laughs> right. It kind of take in general, I think we get into the valley of death and not what we start. Clay take 1.0 or the climate take uh, we are in right now. And you get a lot of funding uh, in the early stage. But you, a lot of startups have a hard time uh, getting the loan, getting the capital to build the first of its kind plan because bank is not uh, instrumented uh, to give a loan to a technology that is first of its kind. So this is where I think the funding gaps uh, is a problem. And I think the government uh, is trying to fix that with the uh, loan guarantee but it's still uh, quite hard. And uh, I feel like there's a lot to be done uh, to really address the climate change. And there has to be a bridge to bankability uh, to support the startup that are bringing the new technology to do the decarbonization. So um, yeah, I think uh, that is one, one way uh, to look at it. And I certainly feel like there has to be more funding uh, toward a uh, private function company as well to help them accelerate uh, the commercialization so that they can get to, you know, the first fusion power plant that connect to the grid sooner rather than later. We cannot wait until 2050 to build fusion power plant. We have to build it in the 30 so that we are on track to net zero 2050. If you don't start now, we'll never get there. Yeah, certainly. So what's next for TDK Ventures? What are you looking at on the horizon? Where do you think your next big plays are going to be? Yeah, I think uh, we want to decarbonize hard to abate sector, uh, whether it's aviation, shipping, cement, steel, industrial heat, these are uh, the big ticket items that contribute a big portion to the global climate change and not to mention the building sector as well. The building sector contribute to like 30, 40% of the global greenhouse gas. So we are uh, diligently looking at technologies that can become venture scalable and address uh, climate change and decarbonization of all these different sectors. For for audience members who who may know of um, uh, you know a company that may fit this thesis or perhaps have skill sets that they they think may be uh, of use for someone in you know, a group within the portfolio company, what's what's the best uh, way for them to 
I don't know, start a conversation with, with you or TDK in general? Yeah. So uh, please reach out. Uh, we can be contacted via uh, our email is contact at tdk-ventures.com or go to our website and then you'll find a lot of information about uh, our company, our investment thesis and the uh, deep explorations that we are looking at. So that would be a good way to start a conversation. Now, I'm Tina Posikovo from TDK Ventures. Say ciao.